like to uh, go ahead and do that and be turning with us this morning to the book of Exodus, the 17th chapter. The book of Exodus, the 17th chapter. Uh, kind of an odd thought this morning. Uh, going to battle with the church. Now, that could be taken a couple of different ways. You could either be going to battle with the church or you could be going to battle with the church. I mean, however uh, that works out. But you see, as I was thinking about this scripture this week and it's just been something that has been just constantly coming back to my heart. And I, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I tried to get away from this scripture. There was a couple other things that I was uh, studying towards and praying towards. And as I did, the Lord just kept directing me back to this scripture about Moses and, and all that he had went through. So a little backstory as you're finding your places in the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. We know how that Moses was uh, you know, chosen of God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. How that uh, he would, went down to Pharaoh and, and the many miracles that were done and how that God had provided an escape for Israel at this time. They went down and crossed the sea. The sea fell in on Pharaoh and his horses and and drown them, and now the children of Israel are out in the wilderness. They're out wandering. They're, they're on their way to the promised land. And what do they do? They don't look back and thank God for what's going on. They want to murmur and complain. They uh, fuss about the blessings of God. Do you ever find yourself fussing about the blessings of God? Uh, you know, the things that God has filled your life with, the things that God has been so good with, and we fuss about them? We fuss about our stupid car or, you know, that, that leaky pipe in the house we live in or, you know, the backed up toilet that's there. Those little things that, that sometimes just get us so torqued up. I mean, we just get all tore up and tore up fussing about the things that God blesses our life with. And, you know, it's a shame that we get to that point. That's exactly where the children of Israel got to. They, they had went out. God had delivered them out of bondage. He had took them out of Egypt. He had made a way, kept them safe, protected them, was defeating enemy after enemy in front of them, and all they wanted to do was complain about what they didn't have. Sounds a lot like church people today, does it not? We want to complain about what we don't have. We so often neglect to look at what we do have. We, for, we forget to look around at the blessings of God, so we complain about the things that we don't have. And so what did God do? He provided manna for them. And, and for 40 years they ate manna, okay? So 40 years... And if you read the description of it, it said it was, a wa- it, 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 it was a wafer that tasted like honey, okay? I mean, it wasn't just sustenance. It was good tasting sustenance, right? I mean, God time after time after time had gave to the children of Israel and all they wanted to do is fuss and fuss and fuss and fuss and gripe and gripe and gripe. And now we're coming up to the time where uh, Moses had, had gotten water from the rock and now they're getting into battle with the Amalekites, okay? Now, these Amalekites, if you study back on them, they were descendants of Esau, okay? They were, uh, they were out of a different line. They worshipped Baal. They were Baal worshippers. They were worshippers of, of false gods and false idols. And the children of Israel were getting ready to go in there, and it says here in the 8th verse, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with a rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had had said to to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Then, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Stop reading right there for a moment. I want you to kind of get the scene here for a moment. As Amalek came down to battle the children of Israel, Moses was looking out into the, uh, at, at, towards the battle and how that he 
He made a commandment to Joshua. Now, there were several parts of this scripture that has stood out in my mind and stood out as I was studying it and the Lord had revealed a few things to me about what was going on here. It said that Moses said to Joshua, he said, choose out or choose us out men to go out and fight with Amalek. Now, you may read past that scripture and it may not seem like it's very much, but now as I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the commandment that Moses gave to Joshua, he said, you go out and choose out the men that will go out and fight. Now, who do you think Joshua chose? Joshua just didn't go out and say, hey, you know what? You, 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 and you look good. Let's go. I'm sure now I'm just thinking about Randy and his old country boy logic, okay? If I was going to go out to battle, I don't want to just go out and say, huh, Let's just draw straws or everybody wearing a blue shirt. Let's go fight. I'm going to go out and I'm going to say, hey, I want the guys that know how to fight to go with me. I want, the, I want the warriors on my side. I want the men who I know won't turn and run in battle. I want those people that will go and stand when the battle gets hot. I want those guys with me. That's the ones I want with me. I'm sure most of you all would probably agree with that logic that you wouldn't just go out and pick the weakest or the, the ones that, were, uh, that had a propensity to run. You'd probably go out and you'd want the guys that had some backbone about them, some courage, a little bit of sand in their crawl, if you will, that knows how to fight. That's who I would choose. I'm sure that's probably who Joshua chose too. You say, Brother Randy, how does that matter to us in the church today? Because I'm going to tell you something, whether you realize it or not, you're in a battle. A lot of times I think we have become so comfortable in the church today that we have forgotten that we are in a battle. We are in a battle against Satan's forces. We are in a battle against worldly influence. We are in a battle against the devil or the evil one. We are in a battle against all that he's trying to do, not only outside of our churches, but inside of our churches. We are in a battle. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If we were put together an army to go out and fight, would you be worthy of being chosen? If I were to look out and say today, hey, the Lord has told me to tell someone to, to choose him out some men and go and fight, would you be somebody that they would choose? If not, why not? I'm afraid what we have today in today's church is we've got a lot of people that are, for lack of a better term, they're culls. Remember the story of Gideon? When Gideon went out and he, and he, and he chose his 30,000 to go out with him and the Lord kept uh, whittling down the number? Because he said, listen, don't, don't worry about these, these guys ain't got enough. These guys, this is not the right crowd. I'm going to whittle you down. I'm going to whittle you down. And he whittled him down to a tenth or, or less of percent of what he started with. And, 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 and there was Gideon saying, well, I guess, you know, is this what I got to fight with? I'm going to tell you what. I wonder sometimes today if, and, and, and I hate to say it this way, but I wonder if we are, have not become a bunch of culls in God's eyes. Do you have enough about you? Do you have enough spirituality about you? Do you have enough uh, sand in your crawl, so to speak, to be a good warrior for God today? Do you, do you yearn for the Spirit of God to be in your life? Do you study the Word of God? Do you take this sword that God has equipped us with and be ready for battle? Or do we just passively just go on by our day? You see, I'm sure there was a lot of people there that Joshua didn't choose. There was a lot of people that was there that Joshua said, no, not you, not you, not you, not you. And as I was studying this, I kind of felt a little sorry for, for Moses and Joshua at this point because there was probably in reality a lot more that they didn't choose than they did choose. And I wonder today if you were in that crowd and the spiritual witness that you have about your life, if you were there, would you have been chosen or not? You ever thought about it? You're in this battle, but are you even a warrior? Whether you like it or not, if you're a child of God, you, you've been recruited, you've been drafted into the army. My dad used to talk about that. He was drafted as a young man, got sent to Vietnam. And he said one of the things that he learned really quickly is, he said that the idea of freedom and, and flags and First Amendments and, and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, all those things, he said, absolutely mattered zero. He said, when you're in battle, he said, you're in battle for yourself and the person standing beside of you. He said, that's all that mattered. He said, the idea of freedom and the flag and all that was great. He said, that's, he said, patriotism is great. He said, but when the bullets are flying past your head, he said, the one that really matters is yourself and the people beside of you. And he said, you'll do anything you can to make sure that they're okay and survive. You depend upon each other. I wonder today, do we realize that some of the people sitting beside of you, that their, their existence spiritually depends on what you do? 
My dad told the story once about they were out one night, and he said, was out in the middle of the jungle, and he said, somebody decided to light up a cigarette. He said, now, when you're in somewhere that's completely dark and it's completely void of light, when you light up a cigarette, you might as well be holding up a torch. You might as well be holding up a spotlight, saying, here I am. Not a good tactical move. And he said, at that point, you jeopardize everybody's safety around you. I wonder today, do you realize that in the battle that the church is in today against Satan, that, that you can jeopardize the people around you? What God needs is people that have kind of an Isaiah kind of attitude. When he was there, and we read about it a few Sundays ago, where in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, when Isaiah finally had seen the, the glory of the Lord and the Lord had cleaned him up, Isaiah, when, when the call went out, who shall go for us and who shall stand for us, Isaiah raised his hand and said, God, here I am. Choose me. I'll go. I'll do it. He chose not to remain anonymous. Today I think we got a lot of people in church that want to be anonymous. I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be called out. I don't want to be recognized. I don't want anybody to look at me. I want to be able to filter in and filter out and not be missed if I'm not there. Well, welcome to small church life. If you're not here, you're missed. Okay? I love small churches. I love them. You know why? Because you get to know everybody. There's a personal connection with each and every person that you sit in the pews with. You know about them. You know about their families. You know what they raise in their gardens. You know what kind of car they drive. You know everything about them. And there is a personal connection. There's a deep bond that is formed in small churches, and I love that deep bond. And I'm not bashing big churches. I'm just saying uh, smaller churches, they have a, a bond that is formed, and it's hard to replace. It's hard to get past. And the last thing I want to do with my church family, because that's truly what you become as a church family, is to think that I let one of my family members down by not being ready to be in the battle. I'm going to tell you something. If my wife and my kids or my family, if, if some, some kind of threat is towards them, I'm not a bad man. I'm not a mean man. I'm not a born fighter, okay? But if you want to see the fighter come out of me, you threaten my family. I'm not a warrior, but if you want to see what little warrior blood there is in my gene pool, you threaten my family and you see what happens. Because I'm willing to die for them. I'm willing to die for my family. I'm willing to, to die for my church family. I, I, I'm willing to put myself upon the altar of sacrifice for my family and my church family. Are you willing to do the same thing? That's exactly what kind of men that, that Joshua was looking for when he went out to do battle. He was looking for men who were ready to lay their life on the altar of sacrifice in order for the others to be able to have life. Today, what are you willing to sacrifice? Well, Brother Randy, you don't understand how busy I am. Really, I don't. I have, I have a pretty good idea how busy you are, about as busy as everybody else. But at some point, you've got to say, you know what? It doesn't matter how busy I am. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. God is more important. And the bride of Christ, which is the church, has a mission. And that mission must be fulfilled. And to have a mission that's fulfilled, there must be people to fulfill it. Joshua didn't go down to the battle by himself. Joshua chose him out an army to go down with him. And he went down to fight, and here's what happened. It says that as he went down to fight, Moses told Joshua, he said, Listen, now I'm going to go up on the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And I'm, and I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to watch over this. Now, I don't know if there was some prearranged deal between God and Moses to where they knew that if he held his staff up that they were going to win. I don't know. The Bible doesn't really clearly say that. But at some point in this battle, they figured it out. That as Moses stood up there and he held the rod of God up. Now I don't know if that meant that the men looked up and they could take courage because they saw Moses up there with the rod. I don't know if there was uh, some, some prearranged spiritual thing. I don't know. But whatever it was, Moses stood up there and he held that rod up. And as he held that rod up, this says that as long as he held it up, as long as he held up the rod, that the children of Israel won. As long as he held it up, we win. But the minute we lay it down, we lose. Amen. Folks, can I tell you today, we've got to hold up the word of God today. 
we got to hold this up. Because I'm going to be honest with you. Laying on the coffee table at the house, it looks good for decoration when people come over, but it don't do much good unless you open it up and get into it. It makes a, it makes a really good ornament somewhere. You, you remember the old family Bibles and they had those little little things that they, they would hold them open and you, you could go through and you know people would have them as decoration. You walk in their house and they'd have some little piece of furniture somewhere over here to the side and on that thing they'd have a family Bible and it would lay there and you know and and I would say 99.9% of the time people would walk by each and every day and probably never even stop to read the words that was in it. And then you could get pick it up one day and go <laughs> and blow the dust off the pages. I'm going to tell you something, a dusty Bible is not no good. A wore out Bible is good. And I'm going to make a deal with you, okay, church? And listen to me. If you wear your Bible out studying it, we'll get you another one. You hear me? If you wear your Bible out studying, we'll get you another one. If your Bible becomes so marked up and wrote up because you've taken notes all through it where the Word of God has spoken to your heart and you get to the point where you say, I ain't got a space to put another note in this Bible. Man, I could use another Bible. You come and see me. We'll get you another Bible. But now don't come to me if the back of it's wore out where it just got scooted from place to place on the coffee table. If you wear a blister on the back cover just where you're scooting it from side to side, don't come see me. I want to see some wear and tear on the pages. I, I want to see some dog ears in there. I want to see, I want to see some, tear, and, and, and you're going to tear one occasion. There's a little paper they put on there. They'll tear occasionally. When you tear it, I don't mind tore. I'll be honest with you. But we need to hold up our rod. Moses was there, and he was holding up the rod as, as the children of Israel went into battle. And it says that like everything that happens, now I, I can relate just a little bit to Moses. It said that Moses got tired. Moses got tired. I can just imagine. Tell you what, if you want to try it sometime, you can try it now if you want to. Grab your Bible, grab your book, and just hold it up there for a while. And you know what's going to happen? You'll do good for a minute or two. And you'd be surprised how heavy one of these things gets when you hold it up that long. And you hold it, and you hold it, and hold it, and what's going to happen is that thing's going to start dropping. Pretty soon you'll be like, oh, and you'll maybe shift arms with it. And that arm's going to get tired. Pretty soon you're going to get cramped. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine having to hold this up? And, and if they, we was in a battle right now and people's lives depended upon this and people were going to die if I didn't hold this up, if, if you were looking at me right now and as long as I held this thing up and you said, Brother Randy, please hold that up because if you let that thing down, we're going to die. If you, if you put that down, we're going to die. Please hold that up. I can already tell you, no longer I've been holding this up, my fingers are tingling. The blood runs out of you. I mean, you get tired. I can only most imagine what Moses was feeling. He was holding up the rod of God, and he, was, he realized that lives were dependent upon his strength. He had to realize that, that when he let that down, people died. Those chosen men, those good warriors that Joshua had chosen out of that group of people were dying because his strength was failing. You ever get that way sometimes? You ever feel like you get tired? I know you do. We got people in this church that serve. We got people in this church that work hard to make sure this happens. A lot of people show up every, each and every Sunday and they think that it's some kind of uh, magic spell that God cast on it. That when you show up for church, man, it just happens. It's just there. Well, man, I'm glad that God, God opened up them doors this morning and God had the bathrooms clean and, and the temperature was right and they were singing was good. and the piano. Oh, God just does so good, don't he? He does, but you know what? He uses people to do it. And I thank God for the people that we got that work so hard to make sure that all this easiness that you take part of happens. I thank God for those people. The last thing I want to do is see those people perish if this word goes down. The last thing I want to see is those people get so tired that they are so worn out from serving time and time and time again that they finally get so worn out they say, you know what, I just got to put it down. Because that's what's going to happen. Believe it. I've seen it time after time after time. They get burned up. They get burned out. I'm not blaming them. Hey, if you feel like you're the only person ever doing anything, and everybody else is just riding in, enjoying it, and then riding out. You got no ties, no responsibilities, no nothing. Guess what? You can get worn out in a hurry. It takes a stout heart to be able to do that every, each and every week. 
Church, I'm going I'm to lay something on you. If you're here and you ain't doing nothing, then you ain't doing right. Like it or not. If you're here, if you're listening on Facebook, if you catch this on YouTube and you're a member at Clear Branch Baptist Church and you ain't actively participating in the services at Clear Branch Baptist Church and you ain't taking your responsibility, then you ain't living right. Boy, now that's going to wrinkle some feathers. But that's just the way it is. 10% of the people does 90% of the work. Shame on us. Shame on us if we allow somebody else to carry our burdens all the time. When I was dating my wife, I was courting her, I was wooing her, and I would carry her books to class for her. But I'll be honest with you, there's a time I got to where that was hard doing that. And I love her. I was like, man, carry your own books. I done had her at that point. I didn't have to woo her no more. We carry everybody else's burdens. Where are you at? Are you the kind of person that'll sit back and watch the battle and say, ooh, that was bad. Who'd you see that? That was bad. Did you see him get killed? That was, oh, that was bad. Oh, he wasn't fighting hard enough. If he'd have fought a little harder, then he'd have been all right. It's all Moses' fault. Moses, if you hadn't got tired and let the rod down, then they wouldn't have got killed. Moses, it's all your fault. If you'd have been a better leader, then them people right there wouldn't have been dead. Moses was doing all he could. Moses was doing all he could. He was, he's holding it up. I'm glad for Aaron and her, the rest of the story, I'm glad for Aaron and her because Aaron and her realized that Moses was going to get tired. Moses, they saw Moses holding that rod up, and I'd say at some point his knees might have begun to buckle. But he has some skin in the game. That was, his, that was his people down there. That was his family members. That was the people he loved that was down there dying in the battle. And he had to keep that staff up. He had to keep that rod up there. And I would say he would have given every ounce of strength that he had in his body to make sure that rod stayed up. And he was doing all he could. And Aaron and her looked over and they said, Oh, Moses is getting tired. Get him a rock. Get something for him to sit on. They rolled a rock over there. I said, Here, Moses, sit on the rock. Mm. There's a whole lot to that, ain't there? Everybody, you sit on the rock. You know what that rock is? That rock is Jesus Christ. That is the promise of Jesus Christ and his saving grace. Sometimes even the leaders, amen, need to sit back and realize that they've got a source of strength that is greater than what they are. That strength comes through Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you something. Here, church, if you're here and you're one of our leaders and you're getting tired and you're getting a little worn out, if you're getting a little beside yourself, can I say something? Lean back on the rock. Lean on him. He ain't going nowhere. He'll hold it. He'll hold your weight. He's got you. They set old Moses down on the rock. Moses still holding up the staff. And they said, hmm, his arms must be getting tired. Aaron looked over at her, and I could just picture her. Hey, you get one side, I'll get the other. And we'll hold it. Moses, it, it's okay, buddy. We got you. I got you. You don't have to worry about that. You just, you just rest your arms on me. And I could just picture them over our cradle in Moses' arms. And as long as they cradled his arms and that rod went up, it says the children of Israel won the battle. And it said that they held him up so long that Joshua won the battle. They held him up so long that Joshua won the battle. I want to ask you something today. Are you willing to stand beside your brothers and sisters and hold them up? Are you willing to come alongside them and be their Aaron and her? Maybe you're here today. Maybe you say, well, I don't have a gift of teaching or maybe I don't have a gift of singing or, or maybe I don't have a gift of, of something else. I'm going to tell you something today. Maybe that's not your gift. Maybe your gift is holding. But tell you what, how about you be the very best holder that you could possibly be today? I might not be able to preach. I might not be able to sing. I might not be able to play the piano. I might not be able to teach a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class. But boy, I tell you what, Brother Randy, you ain't going to have to wonder if about me when you look out on Sundays and Wednesdays. Guess who's going to be there? I'll be there. You'll know I'm there. You ain't going to have to wonder whether I'm going to show up. You can't preach bad enough or sing bad enough to run me off. I got more sand in my crawl than that. You don't have to worry about it. Preacher, I'm here and I'll be here. The Lord can depend upon me. 
Ooh, ooh. But brother Randy, you don't understand how busy I am. How about this? How about if the Lord took all your busy away from you? How about if the Lord took and stripped you of every blessing that you've got that takes all your time? What if the Lord said, you know what? Obviously, that job is too much for you. You can't serve me and the job both. How about I just take the job away from you? Oh, your, your, your kids play ball or, or dance or cheer or, or have to do all these other things and you want to use them as a crutch? How about this? How about I take their health from them or your health from them? Well, you can't even do that anymore. How about that? Then you can come to church. You ever thought about that? All the blessings that God has blessed us with, our boats, our cars, all these other things that we got. And God says, you know what? You really don't need that because you're putting it in front of me. I'll take that away from you too. Can you imagine if he did that? Every excuse that we use to keep from serving him. Can you imagine if he stripped those excuses away from us? Where would we be then? Brother, I don't like to think about it because my heart would be broken. You know why? Because your heart's set on them and not God. Can I ask you a question? If you took all the blessings that you got and you was to take them over here somewhere and get rid of them, would you still be happy because you got uh, Jesus in your heart? Would you still be happy because you got a Savior that loves you and he died for you? Is the only reason you love him is because of what he's given you? If the only reason you love him is because of what he's given you, then your heart is in the wrong place. Your heart should be with God because he's God. Moses loved these people. Moses loved them. He loved them enough to give up the very best life that he could possibly have ever had as far as possessions go. He was considered an adopted family member of the Pharaoh. He had it all. By, by what had happened to him in his life, all he had to do was just ride it out. He would have had the fanciest of everything. He was, he was powerful. He might not have been like blood kin, but hey, you got to admit, being, being kinship to the king had its perks, right? He saw something like he had done, snap his finger and say, hey, hey, Pharaoh, I'd really like to have it. Oh, you got it. You want that? Sure, you got it. He looked down there and saw his people, though, and he saw them being persecuted, and he had to do something about it. That's when he jumped into the battle. He killed an Egyptian that was mistreating one of his, and that started the whole sequence of events that led to him leading these children to the promised land, only to be fussed at and ripped at. Sometimes we love people, and what we get back sometimes don't feel much like love, does it? You know what I love about Moses? He never stopped loving them. He never stopped loving them. He, oh, he'd go to God and he'd say, God, I don't understand it. I don't get them. Lord, you've been so good to us. I'm getting a little frustrated here. I'm getting a little aggravated with them. But I still love them. Because you realize what Moses done? Moses, whenever he failed, and through his pride and his anger, he failed. And God told him, he said, Moses, he said, you'll, you'll not go into the promised land. You'll not be able to go there. How many of us at that point would have quit? How many of us at that point would have said, okay, well, if I can't go, then I ain't leaving nobody else. I give up. A little hardship comes along, I give up. Somebody hurts my feelings, I give up. Somebody sings my song, I give up. Somebody sits in my seat, I give up. Somebody parks in my space, I give up. You laugh, it happens. I've seen people walk out of a church. I've seen people walk away from church because uh, you worship the wrong way, you talk the wrong way, somebody says something hurt my feelings, I don't like that color, I don't like that song, I don't like that style. I mean, people walk away from church all the time over it. You know what I thank God for? I thank God for the people who don't walk away. Moses could have walked away. He could have said, you know what, this, this people ain't worth it. All they do is gripe, moan, and complain, God. I'm going to kick my feet up right here and I ain't taking nary another step. But no, he said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to keep on going. God, you wanted me to get them here to there and that's exactly where we're going. Now, I might not be able to get over into there, but I'm going to get your people to there. And along the way, I've got some people here that I'm going to train up. I've got, I got old Joshua over here. He's been a faithful servant. Old Joshua, he's been right there with me. He's, he's done everything I asked him to do. He's been in the midst of the battle. He's, he's fought. He's proved himself. He's got some backbone. He's got some courage. God, if you need somebody to replace me with, that man right there is a good man to do it. But I'm going to take him as far as I need to. And when it's my time, it's my time. 
Oh, that we had more people that would stick to it. Oh, that we'd have more people that say, you know what, my commitment means something to me. Like it or not, like it or not, when you join Clear Branch Baptist Church, now listen to me, when you joined Clear Branch Baptist Church, you made a commitment. Now I know commitment means something different today than it used to, but it shouldn't. Commitment means that whenever I said I would do something, then the only thing that's going to keep me from doing it is the Almighty God telling me not to do it. I don't care if it's hard. I don't care if it's popular. I don't care if it's a sacrifice. You do what you said you'll do. Boy, that's an old-fashioned value, ain't it? It's old-fashioned to think the commitment actually means something anymore. I, think, I still think it means something. I still think it means something to be a part of a church. I still think it means something to look out and see my brothers and sisters and realize, you know what? I'd fight for them, and I believe most of them would fight for me too. It still means something to know that one of these days when the battle gets rough, I'm not going to have to wonder if somebody's got my back. I don't even have to think about it. I know that somebody's got my back. I can live with the assurance of knowing that somebody's got me. Somebody, if, if they can't be there physically, they'll be there praying for me. They'll be there with words of encouragement. They'll be there telling me, hey, it's all right. Brother, we got this. And you won't have to look around and wonder whether I'm there or not. Don't, don't even turn your head to the side to see whether I'm there because you'll know I'm there. Oh, that we had that kind of commitment. Churches all over the land today are struggling everywhere. You know why? Because people have, have forgotten their commitment. They want to remain anonymous. They want to just filter in and filter out, not be seen, not be heard, not have no part. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. I want to be one that when Joshua went out to look over that, that crowd, I want him to say, hey, when I was a kid growing up, I weighed about 100 pounds or 120 pounds when I was in high school. I was skinny as a stick, slow of foot, not athletically gifted. And I was 90% of the time the last person they'd pick for a team. That's okay. We're not playing ball. We're in a spiritual war. I won't be the one that God looks down and says, hey, I, I can count on him. Will you be the one? When God looks down and says, I can count on him, I can count on her. When I got a job to do, they'll be the first one to line up and say, I'll do it. When something's going on, they'll be the first one to jump in and say, where can I help? When there's something going on or somebody's hurting, I'll be there to help you bear your burden. I'll share with you. What do you need? I'll be there for you. Will you be that person today? If we're going to go into battle with the church, can we be the church to go into battle with? Because I'm going to tell you something. I don't, I don't know if you all have noticed, but the world ain't getting no better. Satan is doing just and I hate to give credit, but I'll give credit where credit is. He's doing a wonderful job at, at messing with the world. He's had thousands of years to perfect his craft, and he does very well at it. But I thank God that I serve one that's way more powerful than that. I thank God that I serve today one that can break his hold on this world. I thank God today that I serve one that can make a difference in a lost and dying world. And how's he going to do that? He's going to do it with his church. But it's going to be a fight. Because Satan ain't going to roll over. Satan ain't going to give up. He ain't going to just hand it over and say, well, you won, guys. He's going to fight and he's going to scrap and he's going to do everything he can. If you don't believe me, why do you think half the pews are empty this morning? He's tearing up families. He's tearing up homes. He's tearing up lives. If he can't destroy them through anger and malice, he destroys them by luring them away, by giving them more than they ever thought. He'll make their possessions look like they're the best thing in the world. And it's way more important than what, what God is. Today we need more people to be in the fight. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask if they will come and get a song. And I'm going to ask you today, if we go into this battle against Satan, will you be there with me? Simple question. Back in the old days, they had a, a system of fighting. 
I'd probably call it the wrong thing. I, I, I do believe it's called a phalanx uh, defense, but basically what would happen was they would lock shields. And, and this guy here, he'd bring his shield up, and he would, he'd sit down, and the next person would overlap his shield a little bit. He'd stand beside of him. The next person would lap, stand beside him and lap his shield over a little bit. And the next person would do the same thing. And by overlapping their shields, when the enemies would come rushing towards them, it wasn't just one man's strength that was holding that shield back. Because of the way they were laying on each other, and they were touching each other, everybody shared the strength. So one person didn't have to bear it alone. One person would fall. But everybody standing beside of each other made up a strong system. You notice what I said there? You have to stand beside each other, and you have to kind of get close to somebody to do that. And you're standing beside of them, and you say, hey, you know what? And I don't know about you, but if I'm, if I'm here on my shield, and I'm here, on, and I'm looking to my right and to my left, and I'm saying, hmm, I'm glad I got these two. They get it. They understand that we're in a battle, and our lives depend on this. Folks, we're in a spiritual battle. Satan would desire to sift us like wheat, as he told, Jesus told Peter. He said he desires us to sift you out. He's still desiring to sift us out. Will you be somebody that we can stand beside of? If not, would you like to be? If so, this altar is always open. As we stand, as we sing.